tonight. I'm here with two of my fellow colleagues, Lucy Del Guadio and Arlay Khan. And we're here to talk to you about military sexual assault violence trauma. And uh, there's a lot that's been going on of late. Um, many of you, I hope that all of you have now heard uh, the story of Vanessa Guillen at this point, which really has mobilized grassroots efforts like the one that Lucy and myself are a part of. Uh, and then we have folks at uh, organizations like Protect Our Defenders, like Adelaide, who have been fighting this for years, knowing that service women are um, a particularly vulnerable population when it comes to military sexual assault, violence, uh, and harassment. It's a male-dominated profession. And those of us who go into it, we know what we're signing up for, but it's no longer the cost of admission for the military. And a lot of us are fighting to change that now. And so... Um, we hope this will be an enlightening conversation. We're going to flub through it, um, probably, just because it's Zoom and we're all at home. So, um, but we hope that you learn from this discussion as well. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Adelaide. He's going to give a little bit more of the stats and some of what's been grounding the work that's happened um, preceding Vanessa Guillen's uh, tragic death at Fort Hood and uh, the work that we're trying to do now going forward. So, Adelaide? Yeah, thank you, Melissa. So I'm with the organization Protect Our Defenders. We were founded in 2011 after uh, it became apparent that military sexual violence was not uh, necessarily getting the national attention that it deserved. Um, and so we were founded to solely focus on the epidemic of military sexual assault um, and violence in the military. And um, every year uh, we push through and, and with the support of obviously grassroots organizations and other organizations dedicated to this issue, different legislative changes that help make this the process better for reporting sexual violence in the military, but uh, there's obviously a lot of room for improvement. Um, so just to give an example of the scale, because it's, it's truly uh, mind-blowing when, when the numbers are actually revealed, um, in fiscal year 2018, uh, 20,500 service members uh, were sexually assaulted or raped in, in, the service, in the services. This is only counting active duty service members. This is not counting civilians. This is not counting right. children. This is not counting people who, you know, live in a different country who, who might be serving or, sorry, living alongside a base. Um, and to Melissa's point, you know, 13,000 of those were women. Uh, so it's truly mind-boggling how, how big of a problem this is and uh, the rates are, are only going up and we, we won't receive this year's data until next year but we um, based on the trends it's not an issue that's going away so with that uh, Lucy Hi. <laughs> yeah. so my name is Lucy Delgadio I'm a US Army veteran and a sexual a military sexual um, trauma so I, I don't want to say trauma, but I'm a survivor, and every day it's a, it's a process, and the recent light has really, um, you know, the Vanessa Guillen case has really brought a lot of us together in order to fight this fight and to really make it known what is happening in our military today and every day. And uh, it was a very bold move of many service women, um, veterans, um, that we decided to form a coalition to really fight and make a change. Oh. Um, and that's, bless you. <laughs> um, but, um, it was, uh, it's, it's, there's something in the air right now that really gave us the strength to go forward and to have more of a voice and to tell our stories and to share with others what we actually experienced. Um, and uh, it's been it's been an interesting movement. I would say the last seventy plus days. Yeah, we got started on Fourth uh, of July weekend when uh, Vanessa Guillen's remains were found outside of Fort Hood, and Lucy and I jumped on a, a Zoom call with about thirty or forty other women veterans. Um, I'm also a U.S. Army veteran, um, former Army captain, and. It was an outpouring of emotion and of trauma. Um, a lot of us felt re-triggered, re-victimized um, in some ways by it. Um, there's also something that I tend to point out whenever I testify before Congress or listen to really anyone will listen is that it's even 
a sharper problem, it seems, that we're seeing for our black and brown service members and our black and brown uh, veterans as well. And it's something that follows us throughout our life. Like the reason why we all got onto this painful yet cathartic call the 4th of July weekend um, in order to start this grassroots movement in support of Vanessa Gann's legacy um, it, it was because a lot of us, you know, the, the T stands for the trauma, military sexual trauma, and a lot of us still deal with it, whether it's harassment. I call the harassment death by a thousand cuts. Um, it, it's, it's constant. It's daily when you're serving on active duty, uh, at least was my experience of comments about physique, about uh, sexual innuendo, all sorts of things. And a permissive environment for that type of harassment can lead to assault. It can lead to uh, other violence against women and men because men are survivors too. And I know we'll, we'll tease all this stuff out later, but all of those emotions were coming to a head and Vanessa Guillen's tragic death galvanized this movement um, to where we finally said just no more, no mas. We're not gonna do this anymore. And I'm, I'm grateful at least, you know, for um, Don Christensen and for Adelaide uh, working at Protect Our Defenders, who've always been chipping away at this. Um, but now it looks like we finally have the wind at our backs. And we're finally going to get through some meaningful uh, legislation that will be tangible and will actually do something beyond a lot of the, the gradual increment, uh, incremental uh, progress that we've seen. But um, we're angry, we're full of rage, we're full of pain, but we're channeling all of that into action these days. Yeah, and you know, I'll I'll just add that uh, the work of Protector Defenders and other organizations that, that focus on these issues could not do what we do without the voices of you, Melissa, and you, Lucy, and the countless others who are brave enough to share their stories. And I really mean what I say when I say brave, because I think what um, obviously uh, sexual violence in any capacity is horrible and unacceptable. And if workplace sexual assault, sexual violence, sexual harassment in any workplace is unacceptable and atrocious and abhorrent and should be, uh, you know, never, should never, shouldn't be a thing. But in the military in particular, and obviously, you know, you, you touched on this a little bit, both of you, is that it, um, when you sign up, uh, you know, you're signing up to, to put your life on the line for your country. Um, and you're doing that with allegedly brothers and sisters in arms who are going to have your back. When those same brothers and sisters are uh, perpetuating sexual violence or sexual harassment against you, and not only that, but then if you're trying to report in the chain of command or your commander or your, you know, in the case if, if you go all the way up to court martial, your convening authorities, like, you know, like, we, we don't believe you, we don't, not only that, but we like this guy who you're alleging assaulted mm -hmm. you, you know. Are you sure? Are you yeah, sure? Are you uh, sure? I, which, which Lucy will go into. Are you sure? Yeah, this happened yeah. to are you? you are you sure this happened to you? And I I I didn't know what to think. Uh, that's the way I was treated. And and again, you know, you were saying that you're supposed to be in a brotherhood. You're supposed to be in a sisterhood. It's supposed to be this um, avenue of camaraderie that is supposed to be very embracing. And I'm not saying that I never received that in the military because I did. There was pockets of my service that I was, it was a lot of camaraderie. I felt very safe. It was a very, it was a really good kinder spirit. I'm still, you know, very actively involved in many of those relationships with many people that I met in the military. But there was that one small pocket of where I just felt completely violated. And it's funny that one small p pocket is really how I look at my military. That's where I see it as tarnished. And it was, um, it's hard to actually try to explain to people how it, it just started. And then you, 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 you use your gut instinct like something is going to, something's going to happen, but you just don't know if it's a mechanism for the person that is actually, you know, for me, eventually became the, uh, my, uh, the person who assaulted me. Was it first very tactical? Was he just trying to see what he was going to get out of me? But it was just, again, it was kind of like, you know, going in for the kill when you're in the hunt type of feeling is that, 
they questioned me over him because of his length of time, how many, you know, how many stripes he had on his uniform, you know, what his service looked like, you know, his, all his, all his brass were, my brass was very tiny at the point because I was just a PFC. So it, it just, again, it's very, that, you know, are you sure statement is something that has plagued me for it's it's plaguing me now it's going to plague me for eternity and you know it, it just shouldn't be asked you know it should be like okay what happened and how could we help you because i wish that was the statement that was made to me like please lucy tell you know pfc chenea what happened what could we do for you how could we help you opposed to get dressed get to the office and are you sure this has happened to you and that's that's again those are words that i will always hear yeah. Oh, yeah. and that's that trauma that's that big t trauma as i call it that it, it it follows us like i that was my long-winded way of saying it, it follows us through our lives it follows us in our ptsd claims um you know claiming ptsd from mst i know this is all acronyms but you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, for those who are familiar from military sexual trauma, it's real. Um, and it presents and manifests in many ways that self-doubt, that um, questioning of yourself, it's gaslighting on, on an institutional level. And um, it, it's something that uh, is far too common. And I know, Adelaide, you've probably heard one, if you've heard a thousand stories, if you heard one, like Lucy's, like how many... Um, are, are under E4 and below, like, you know, initial active duty entry. How many uh, MST survivors are, are you aware of that are at those vulnerable ranks, like Lucy said? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and to, your, to both of your points, the higher up the chain of command you go, the less, um, I, I don't want to, I guess accountability is the right word, because um, for this type of crime, um, because, uh, because the, the, the more insular the community becomes, the higher up you go, the smaller the officer pool becomes. And, um, and the fact that there are, um, you know, so few general officers, and in, in the case of the Air Force, there's no general officers who've ever gone to court martial. And, you know, we all know <laughs> that, uh, None. You know, we wow. see, you know, yeah. So, and there's, there's only been a handful of army general officers. So, um, so it, it's, um, it's, it's, a, so that's why I use the word brave, because it's really, you're so brave, and, and I appreciate you guys being honest, open and honest, because I think it's, it like, you know, he, you're heroes and you're exceptionally brave. But the fact that, to your, to the, your other point, Melissa, is that I think what also is unique to military sexual violence is that you're constantly having to prove to everyone, to your chain of command, to the VA, to, you know, your peers that this happened. And it's, 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 you know, not only are you trying to confront that within yourself, but you're trying to like literally prove to everyone around you that this right. happened and that you need help. Yeah. And, and well, it seems so counter to like where we are now. I mean, we're three years into the Me Too movement and Believe Women. Yeah. And yet this is still the default. And I think it's also a contributed to the rage that we all felt uh, over Vanessa Guillen, that collective rage, is because we're three years into, the, you know, the slogans, and when is it going to finally trickle down to the military? I'm sorry, Lucy, I cut you off. No, no, you didn't cut me <laughs> off. You didn't cut me off at all, but, you know, it's interesting of the, the words, the use of bravery, the use of heroes, because when I think of a hero and I think of bravery in the military, it's because of being affected by, you know, going to deployments, being affected by the war, coming home, you know, as a brave soldier and a hero. I never intended to want to put my name with those, with those, be, you know, with those, you know, um, with, with those connections because I spoke up about military sexual trauma. And to me, that's something that, again, you know, what you're saying, like, I, I, I took a walk to, um, this weekend with a friend who um, was stationed with me when I um, was assaulted. 
And he was the primary reason why I, I actually decided to dive into this Vanessa Guillen case because he, you know, I tried to stay away from it because it was really triggering me. Every time I saw, you know, I, I witnessed a, a, a news report, I was really having an issue with it. So I was kind of trying to stay away from it. And then, you know, he picked up the phone. Hey, how you doing? And I'm like, fine. And he's like, can't look at that picture without thinking of you. And, you know, you're 20, you were 20, she was 20. Mm-hmm. You know, there was just too many, like, coincidence. you know, there was just it, too much likeness. And, and then I decided to really explore. And again, I look at Vanessa right now as a hero. I look at her f- for being brave. Um, but again, I didn't want to put those words to her name because of her leaving us the way she did. And I don't want those names, you know, the, to be the hero, to be brave, because I decided to, you know, I made the decision when I was asked to testify, to accept and say what happened to me. So it, it, it's a double-edged sword because I, as much as I want to advocate and I want to tell people what my fight is, every day it just turns into again like we were talking whirlwind of emotions because at times i don't feel like we should add those names to it but yet i don't want another woman i don't want another man i don't want any of us to experience what we have faced because even the aftermath of you know after leaving the military and then what had what has followed me you know uh you know i i almost became homeless i had a hard time finding a job i had a hard time you know really adjusting to who Lucy was prior to the assault. And that's something that, again, I, I, it's an adjustment and I want everybody to really take a look at that, that how structurally um, that's not what you think the military is actually going to do to you. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny you bring that up, Lucy, because it's like, we talk about now in the conversation, structural racism and, and, um, structural barriers that that hold folks back and, and you just described how MST becomes a structural barrier within the structural barrier so on the one hand um, as I'm like you I'm, you know I've often been told you're the humble vet and you know it's because we don't see ourselves as heroes I mean we wouldn't be answering to a call greater than ourselves if we did um, you know uh, I, I don't know too many people who do that but um, we're not going to have change cultural change to where this is no longer acceptable no longer this permissive environment like they talked about uh earlier until we have more women in the ranks well that's a 30-year pipeline like you were talking earlier adelaide about you know uh the general officers and the lack of accountability rather for general officers um right now the commanding general fort hoods under investigation and rightfully so because outside of even vanessa guillen's case i'm like 28 other soldiers have turned up dead in 2020 alone under mysterious causes. Um, So, you know, it's, it's insane, the lack of accountability, but you're not going to see that change until you, frankly, you see more women who are within those senior officer ranks. We don't stay, I didn't stay, you know, Um, I I was an officer, I didn't stay. And it's because of environments like this to where at some point you just say, I can't take this anymore. And um, it, it really does become an issue of where, we want to be brand ambassadors for the military because on the positive side, the military very much shaped who I am. Um, and I know Lucy feels the same way, it very much shaped my morals, my ideals. And, 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 you know, I want to be a force for good within the national security arena today. And it's a part of my motivation for speaking about these atrocities now. Um, but it's also not going to change if people don't stay on active duty. So we have a duty also to protect the uh you know those who are coming up behind us to make sure that they can continue to move forward in their careers um you you mentioned earlier uh you know think about his career and i'm 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 tired of thinking about his career frankly um you know someone think about ours and uh it's not even just for the the junior women but it's for the the sake of women in, in the armed forces period um we're in changing times and this is one of the ways in which we need to adapt yeah, and so I, Lucy, I really appreciate that. So I, I've never, I'm not, I don't have a military background. I've, I've been in this, um, in this world though for the last five years, 
I am a survivor of sexual assault, but not military sexual assault. Um, so um, I, I want to totally with respect to everything you said, because I totally understand. But I think the reason why I use those words, and I don't know if maybe this is, but I feel like, you know, it's, it's reclaiming that. Mm -hmm. status and I feel that you know because we we I you know and you guys too there's so many service members whose careers are ended because of this and sometimes it they get the punishment that their assailant is should be getting and then their career you know they end up with an other than honorable or general uh under yeah. conditions discharge and they're not told that they're brave or they're heroes or they're honor or even honorable and I so I feel that um and I, you know, it's like reclaiming that, like you, you do deserve this. This is what you are. You are, you know, and I, with total respect no. to anybody who's served in combat and any, you know, yeah. to, it, it's a different, it's different, it's mm -hmm. different, but it's no less, to me, no less powerful. But I, but yeah. anyway, it's just. <laughs> no, 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 you don't have no, to apologize. No, no never apologize. No apology. Yeah, no. Well, first of all, we need to, as women, get into a no apology zone. Like, <laughs> myself, is, I think I'm mostly talking to myself as I'm saying this. Um, um, we, we need to just get into a no apology zone, because Lord knows. Um, I'll leave it at that. But, um, <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're right, uh, Arlene, in that, you know, it's, it's just hard to see yourself that way, because it's a time that you also associate with probably your most weakest and vulnerable moments of your life to where you couldn't do anything. And whether it's one assault incident or multiple, um, or if it's harassment that just, I feel like, I, I, I think if you haven't been harassed, you haven't lived, um, you know, to be a woman, um, you know, it just, it's just, it's, we're almost desensitized by it at this point. And so when you, when we talk about the violence that's committed against our bodies, no, you're absolutely right to reclaim that because that is at the crux of it, of, of being a survivor is being able to step forward and say that, yes, I am taking this back and I am reclaiming this for, for myself and, and, and for, for womankind, for survivor kind. So, um, and please do not minimize your own experiences to those no. of, of, of us in the military. I mean, like I said, the, the the only difference that I see with the military sexual with military sexual assault, well, two differences. One, the law, which you know we can get into yeah. some of that in a second. But so the law, obviously, the Uniform Code of Military Justice governs it differently. But then, secondly, what makes military sexual violence um, a little bit different is again that institutional aspect of it, mm -hmm. and that. You know, let's walk the dog of whether you, you, you rep you've been assaulted, you report it, do they believe you, is your assailant prosecuted, um, are you then counter prosecuted in, in a sense, and that uh, you're victim blamed and you're told, well, what were you wearing, where were you going, what were you doing, all the same tropes that you hear in a civilian world. Um, but then from there, it could end up with, you know, we talked about discharges, and so for the civilian audience, you know, and other than honorable, can screw up your whole life. Oh yeah, it, it can it can screw your whole life because that goes on every job application. Have you served? Did you serve honorably? And if you don't have that honorable discharge, it can impact your benefits. It can impact your you know we worked very hard to fix that, but it it I still hear of cases of people not receiving proper mental health care you know because of their uh, other than honorable status. Um, you know, it impacts a lot of things and it, it almost leaves you with this scarlet A on your forehead, you know, it almost leaves Definitely. you with feeling like you're less than because you didn't yeah. get an honorable discharge and the, you were the one who yeah. was assaulted. Yeah, the scarlet M, let's call it the scarlet M of military mm. sexual trauma. But, you know, when we talk about words, I, I, if I have to describe myself, I feel like I became very resilient and I, and I became a more empathetic human being. I became more compassionate. Um, I, I felt like I became more aware of how others are being affected by something that is going to change their life. And yes, mine was based on an assault, but you know, I, I, I was talking to someone about grief and um, I felt that this whole process of being, uh, you know, a, tr a sexual, um, military sexual trauma um, survivor is about, it's a, like a grieving process because that, in that moment in time, 
I'm constantly grieving about me, about the loss of myself, of the, I'm the loss of Lucy after that happened because I will never be the same. And I once in a while look back to how Lucy was prior to her assault. And there's little nuances of Lucy that I wish I could find and I wish I could get back. And that's where, um, you know, those words of, of grief and compassion and resilience and, you know, how, sh you know, those strength values that are something that um, I, I kind of like to relate to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and then I think that we're all struggling for that, that normalcy, whether you're a survivor of military sexual assault or, or sexual assault uh, outside of the military, everyone is still struggling to reach that level of normalcy. Like I said, we, it, it gaslights you when you go through um, these, uh, uh, when, when you go through something like this. And the problem now today, I shouldn't say the pro there's many problems, but um, again, part of why there's so much emphasis on it today, now in 2020, is because we're all sitting at home watching, you know, seminars, webinars, you know, things like this and thinking, my God, if it happened to me, it's happened to anyone. And there's finally this wake up call that, that's coming about to where, um, you know, finally our, our, our movement's getting some real traction in the mainstream. Because that's the other, I think, fallacy. I said there are two things about military sexual violence that, um, uh, that separated apart from the civilian world. But one third thing is that I don't think that folks realize um, the magnitude of the problem. I don't think that they realize um, how much we carry with us for a lifetime. And I think there's also really terrible civilian perception out there that um, we kind of, you know, ask for it. You know, well, why would you, it, it's a man's world. Why, what do you mean, what do you expect? So, and I think I said that in the beginning, you know, the price of admission for the military shouldn't be sexual assault, especially, you know, when you consider cases like mine, I'm a third generation combat veteran. Um, you know, my grandfather was killed in National World War II. He's a Buffalo soldier. My father fought in Vietnam, retired for 27 years. And, and so it's a tradition. It's a family tradition that I'm upholding that. And I'm, no, I'm not unique in that regard. Many of us uphold these family traditions. And it feels like your family let you down. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times it feels like your family let you down. Um, and so there's a lot out there that I think is finally being teased out and added to the thread of the sexual assault conversation, especially vis-a-vis -vis military. Um, I know yeah, that no. we're all, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go yeah. ahead. No, go ahead. No, 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 I was going to say, I mean, I don't know if we want to, you know, pivot toward, you know, um, you know, what we're doing now and some of the work we're doing now, like, I'm excited that we finally have legislation like the I am Vanessa DM bill um, that I think we've all fought for in, in, in various ways, because a lot of folks think, oh, well, wow, that was short order. Nothing in Congress is short order. This isn't leave something that went from flash to bang, so to speak, from July 2nd to now. This has been years in the works. And, and again, a lot of the work is through POD, through Protect Our Defenders, um, you know, recommendations that you've made to armed services committees for years. Mm -hmm. um yeah and i think we should totally talk in, about this this new legislation but i think it would be helpful in case there are civilian listeners out there um to just briefly describe um kind of you know why because because i think the thing that i'm always struck by um and i was so too when i was engaging with this work is how how do not more people know about this problem and how messed up this system is because every time we tell people who have you know who are new to this topic they're always like oh, you know jaw on the ground like how does nobody you know i i swear if, if everybody knew that this was so broken if this was such the case that there would be an, a riot and i'm like well people do know and there there hasn't necessarily been a riot so. <laughs> but yeah. I, I i do think that education is key and oh i i can't i there's so much education that really needs to yeah. take place for me i'm really looking at the education within the latino community and the black and brown communities because we get targeted so much in the recruiting aspect of it you yeah, know yeah. we i'm you know i'm a perfect example of i joined Joined the military because at the time my dad passed away, we couldn't afford um, multiple daughters in the military in, in school. So I had to find an opportunity to get to seek 
money to go to school. So I went the military like my two brothers did. We went into the military way of life. So again, the recruitment tactics, you know, I had a really incredible conversation with Mr. with uh, Vanessa's father when we were at the bills, um, the bill introduction. And he goes to me, Lucy, why is it that they do such heavy recruiting in our areas? Then I go, you know why? Because we need it. We yeah. are looking for that way out. We are trying to better our lives. We are trying to establish that legacy. You heard time and time again how Vanessa from a young age wanted to, to protect and serve her country. She wanted to create that legacy in the military and then it was taken away from her. And again, we didn't protect her that way. And then her dad is like, I didn't know what questions to act and ask. And that again is the lack of education that a lot of people don't know that our civilian laws and our military laws are night and day. And so, you know, you don't know how to ask, you could ask a question as a civilian, but you're not going to get the same answer when you're, you're addressing the military. And that to me is something that again, we kind of have to really do our due diligence when we go into the Latino communities, when we go into the black and brown communities and tell them, you know, it, we don't want to say they're occupational hazards because they slightly have become that, but we have to kind of tell folks, hey, things could possibly happen. And if they do happen, they're not going to be treated the same way as they are in the civilian space. So that's something that I've been really trying to look at of how we could educate more of the communities that are really being focused on when it comes to recruit, heavy recruitment areas. Oh, totally. That's an interesting take, yeah, because, I mean, you're, it's the same, I mean, black and brown community, I mean, I, I mentioned my grandfather, Buffalo Soldier, um, I bring that up because for the black community, the military has always been a pathway to the middle class. It's been the one thing that we could do, even in slavery, to be able to, frankly, fight for your freedom, and in the Latina community, like, right now, the message is, well, uh, you can get, uh, there's a pathway to citizenship. It's a mm -hmm. pathway to citizenship for your family. And uh, we hear, yeah, and education. And so, you know, education and citizenship. And so um, that's always been, the, you know, the carrot and stick that they've uh, baited us with. And it's an honorable one. It really is. Like, I don't want to dispute, like, I go back to what I said before, we're supposed to be in brand ambassadors for the military. Like, I want other women to serve. I want them to know what it's like to command troops and to Feel that authority within yourself because it's denied to us in so many spaces. And, you know, it's not all terrible, you know, and, and that's what I really would love would be the message that comes out of this once we fix this cultural problem in that we're not the secretary pool anymore. And even when we were the secretary pool, it didn't mean that we were a pool for your picking and choosing and, and pillaging, frankly. Um, and, and, and that's, you know, I think what's sadly been the evolution of women um, pretty much in the, in the military, in the, in the American military, we've been fighting to serve and fighting for our respect and our, and, and our parity, uh, since the Revolutionary War. Um, and, and so that's, a, I'm glad you brought that up, Lucy, because yes, we are targeted and it's actually almost a little bit sad in the way in which you mentioned it, because it makes me feel, it reminds me of the talk that we talk about, you know, in, in the black community and that, so you ever get pulled over, these are things that you need to know. And, you know, in having the talk from a military perspective, like I can't imagine, you know, I joined in the 90s like you did. I can't imagine my father telling me then, hey, you know, you just might get raped. So, um, you know, let's talk about when that happens or, or when your, your CO walks up to you, your commanding officer and, and uh, compliments your outfit. What do you say? Why do you say yes, sir? Thank yeah. you. No, I mean, I can't imagine my father, of all people, you know, saying yeah. that or having that, but it seems to be kind of like, it's almost necessary to have that conversation yeah. of knowing what you're getting into. And that's sad. It yeah. And it's very, that way. yeah. And it's very interesting that you say that because my brother was my recruiter. So my brother took me through every step of the process to go into the military. And, and now he, you know, once a month or once a week or when he's, you know, he sees me like in the media, he's like, he calls me and he's like, I'm sorry I did this to you. I'm like, you didn't do this to me. You didn't do this to me. You brought me into your ranks because your army, your mm -hmm. military space was good to you. And you expected that same treatment for your sister. And it just didn't work that way. So it's not your fault. And I constantly have to remind him that, so. 
Yeah, it's, it's nobody's expectation whatsoever. Yeah. And I, was, I will say that I think what, what is uh, striking too, and I, I learned this recently from a client of mine who really said too that um, the black female experience in the military is also very different from the black male experience. And that is um, a yep. lot of part due to the, the, you know, like the way that the uniforms are made, Mm -hmm. Oh up. yes. Here, like I mean, us, I yeah, like yeah, us Latinas feel the same way because again, you know, the again, the military is structurally created for the male, for the you male. know, and you would think by now they would make adjustments so it would be somewhat female friendly, but that hasn't taken place. So uniforms are cut differently. You know, protective gear is cut differently. It uniquely looks incredibly different on us than it does yeah. on our male or counterpart. Or it doesn't protect our lives. Or, like do, I, yeah, or it doesn't protect our lives. When I first deployed to Iraq, I didn't have uh, sappy plates or armor plates to go in your flat jacket because I need extra small ones and they were on back order. And I said, well, was yeah. the war on back over order? Like, why exactly. I, I didn't have them until I'm three That's months into my deployment. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. And, and again, they're not created for us. And again, you know, what, what looks on, looks like on a male does not look like on a female. And, and I remember being on a TDY deployment and uh, they wouldn't let me wear my PT uniform, like the shorts and the t-shirt. They were like, oh, could you wear the sweatpants? I'm like, it's 110 degrees out here. You want me to wear sweats? <laughs> but that's what they asked me to do because again, I didn't look the certain way and they didn't want those eyes on me and I'm like then create something that's going to be okay for a woman to wear if, that, if, yeah. if it's such an issue that I that you feel that my appearance in my uniform is being suggestive then there's an issue and you guys haven't rectified it and oh that's God. where I you know it, it's a struggle it really is a struggle yeah and I think that's an excellent segue into how the structure is inherently is inherently kind of um, focused on, I mean, okay, look, let's, let's be real. Like, you know, we, our society is you're innocent until proven guilty. I'm not saying like, let's throw, you know, law and order out the window, but at the same time in the military, there is a, there is a uh, preponderance of, of doubt given to the survivor survivor. And there, there, it's an uphill battle and it's, you know, like even the prevention thing, like get a battle buddy, you know? So let's, yeah. I want to talk about, how, like, it's like the survivor's responsibility to protect themselves against the big, bad, you know, male pig right. who's, you know, out there raping people with no accountability. Right. Again, and let me give you another example of that. Like, I, 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 for every data point you throw out, I could give you a real-life example that I actually went through or knew someone else did. So let's talk about, like, have a battle buddy, for example. So, again you don't have my sappy plates on, uh, you know, ready for me when I've got to go deploy. So I'm just in a war zone walking around with useless black jacket. Okay, cool. Um, I'm also working a swing shift because I was intelligent. And so that meant that in the middle of the night, I'm walking around base, walking around, like this is not, you know, outside the wire. It's not going on patrols, you know, those things, not scary in comparison. You know what's scary? Walking by yourself to a latrine in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Walking by yourself to a Porta John in the middle of Baghdad when you know that you are out there by yourself and, you know, you could possibly hear a pin drop. Um, I cannot tell you how many assaults took place. I, I was actually in command at the time then. Um, both the ones that reported to me and then also my own, I call them sticky situations of where I was confronted. Uh, was something along the lines of, what are you doing out here this late at night? Well, I mean, it's my effing job. So that's why I'm here. And I'm not going to look for a battle buddy so that I can go, you know, use the restroom uh, like my male counterparts don't have to do. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and a lot of that stuff, I just really just suppressed. I pushed it down like a trash compactor, um, especially when I was outnumbered um, as, a, as a woman and then even as a woman officer. That made me even feel more useless sometimes to protect my troops, to, mm -hmm. to protect the, the women in my charge who would come to me for help. Um, you know, it was all of us against them. And sometimes uh -huh. it could be multiple voices against one. Where does that work out? But again, you see the preponderance of evidence, you know, it doesn't always favor the survivor. 
Um, and that's because the military justice system is still very much subjective. Um, I keep going back to sexual harassment because I truly believe that it establishes a permissive environment for bad behavior. Yep. And that's not a crime. That is not a crime under the uniform code of military justice and hopefully that's going to change you know with with this pending legislation but you know i mean things like that like things that would seem so simple um mm -hmm. are not a part of our uniform code of military justice right and so so for bird's eye view again um it's 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 all very insular the uniform code of military justice exists because you know we have stations all over the world um mm -hmm. it's 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 been in existence since 1951. It, um, it uh, also has a very unique um, military-specific rule of law that wouldn't translate at all to the civilian world. But, um, but it has been very slow to adapt to, um, because if, it, if, you know, if it's going to, if it's going to uh, be uh, also kind of, it, if there are going to be laws that cover other crimes, like felonious crimes that would other be otherwise be covered in the civilian system, it's got to be comprehensive. And I think that the fact that sexual harassment is not considered a punitive offense under the UCMJ is, is shocking to people. Um, yeah. Because, and I think that I was, I was trying to explain this to somebody else the other day, that I think sexual harassment in the military is a whole other beast than it is elsewhere, because it is so baked in, in to the culture, to the um, you know, to, to the, wet back when military unit, there weren't any women in, in the military and, um, misogynistic language was used as a dehumanizer to men yeah. who underperformed. And it's, mm -hmm. it's these, these people who grew up with that being the status quo are still in the military. They're at the yeah. highest ranks right now. And so, you know. And grooming future leaders. <laughs> and exactly. It's exactly. that talk. It's that culture of toxic leadership. It's like, you know, it's like that whole, um, let's call it frat mentality of, yeah. of the hazing um, ceremony. And again, you know, it hasn't changed. It's been very static. And again, you would think with the entrance of more and more women into the military that they would kind of had taken a step back and say, hey, let's make that change. And, and they still haven't done it. And, and again, when you look at realistically, let's look at the, again, the frat mentality. That's why when I, when I talk to survivors of military sexual uh, trauma that are my male counterparts, it, again, it was like they always refer, some of them, I don't want to say all of them, some of them have said, you know, they was referred to as I was being hazed. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't care what they refer to. Assault, a haze is being assaulted, whether you like it or not. And this entrance, this, this entrance into what they call their brotherhood is not acceptable. It, it really isn't. And I shouldn't have had to pay and 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 live the way i live right now because i was trying to make an entrance into a brotherhood that i never wanted to you know make an acceptance to and again i think the way the laws that have again the way it's just a static and how i said gorilla glue to the ground that's what they've done they've just stuck it there they don't want to change it and until we really start making the noise that we're making right now, and hopefully those changes will be made, harassment is still going to take place. I bet you right now we're having this conversation, and I would say two, three, 200 women in the military are being harassed right now because of the way they look, the way they sound, you know, or something to that effect. And it's just, again, it's culturally acceptable to be harassed in the military, which is not acceptable at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. And I think what, um, uh, so, so related to the grassroots movement that you guys have been a part of, um, you guys got to testify on the Hill. How long ago was it? A couple of weeks ago. I feel like it's a couple of years ago. It's 20. It feels like July, yeah, it, but it was July, July 29th. Oh God. July sorry. 29th. Yeah. 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 So, so, and I think what, what has been amazing and I'd love for you guys to talk about, I think it'd be great uh, to talk about kind of the things that this bill might do to change the culture. Cause um, this, you know, ending on kind of a transformative, you know, here's this direction that we may be headed into. Finally, um, you guys, I don't know if you want to speak to that at all and what you guys have been um, able to do with this and, and where we're going. 
Yeah, so we, uh, Lucy and I um, did testify on July 20th before the House Armed Services Committee uh, Military Personnel Subcommittee. So right. that's chaired by... Um, no, July 20, 20th is when we did the call to action. Yeah, the 21st. Call to action. And then the 29th yes. is the day we the testified. 29th is an area. Yes. <laughs> yeah. no, it's been, it's so. been a whirlwind by the same token again, yeah. 2020. Like, wait, what year was that? So like I all said, blending like, together, all blending together. Like Robin Williams and Jumanji, what year is this? <laughs> so, <laughs> but, um, but, but I digress. So uh, the incomparable uh, Chair Spear, Jackie Spear, who is also a survivor herself, who has always been no BS on this issue and has been a champion for women in military, women alike, um, and male survivors, I should say all survivors. Um, you know, it, and uh, so that's been really good in working with her office. Um, a lot of good stuff made what I now call, even though I hate to use this term as a former legislative director, co comprehensive bill. I hate saying comprehensive because it automatically makes people, oh, that sounds like a lot of stuff and it's going to cost money. Um, yeah, it's going to cost money. And yeah, it's, some, it's a lot of stuff. But it's stuff that we've been saying for years. It's a combination of what was in previous iterations, the Military Justice Improvement Act, the STOP Act, these are other, you know, sexual assault uh, bills that are geared toward ending sexual assault or at least uh, alleviating it within the military um, and in the civilian world and combined into one. And so it does things like make sexual harassment a crime under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. People will say, well, why does that need to be a crime? Because we need to take it seriously. Like, we need to start taking it seriously. Clearly, it's not being enforced in the command by commands. Command climate is set from the top down by commanders and if it's not been inculcated by now it's never going to be so now we just have to stop the slaps on the wrist and start with actual punishment um under the uniform code of military justice for harassment that's all of the jokes the innuendo the, the stupid little things that you know we just kind of do ha, 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 and laugh about as a part of our soul dies inside um, and and that, those are the minor microaggressions, you know, like those, but those need to stop. And so that's number one. It takes the, it's the oh yeah, sure. That, 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 that expand that, that, like what I'm saying, all of us have been saying, like it, it, in a unit where you're supposed to have each other's back, all those microaggressions just build and build and build and build. And then so absolutely a, a, a whole unit, a whole battalion, a whole service branch, a whole military that can't trust each other. But anyway, continue. <laughs> Exa no, you're absolutely right. It does every, like we talk all the time in, in the military about building a spree de corps and about unit cohesion, and this completely erodes and undermines that. Um, if I, again, if I'm fearful of my own unit when I'm walking to the latrine in the middle of the night, who's out there fighting alongside of me, exactly. you know? How can you command them if you can't trust them? Exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, we, we see movies like Courage Under Fire where you know, men turn on women and, you know, like, I don't want to bring too much Hollywood into it. But yes, there, there's a lot that, you know, that, that your mind starts racing when you start thinking about those things. And my mind should even go in those directions, frankly. Um, so that's one. Um, it, the other thing that I'm glad about within this bill is that it's going to take the subjectivity of whether to prosecute out of the hands of, of, of commanders and the prosecution itself into special prosecutors who are trained to work with survivors. Um, it's, it's going to revamp, you know, that, that whole investigate, investigatory process and prosecution process. And it needs to happen. And I can tell you again is, you know, I was a, you know, commander of troops at the age of like 25. I don't know nothing at 25. And I mean, like, I, I'm being very good about not using curse words today um, because I am military and that part didn't leave me. Um, <laughs> but I can tell you all the things I didn't know in four letter words when I was 25 years old. And I didn't even have the legal protections as a commander that a lot of uh, folks have now to where you can enforce reporting, enforce, you know, that um, you know, that the soldier, the service member is taking care of, a lot of that wasn't there. And so what could happen is, again, realistic scenario, you could have a service member walk up to you, report being assaulted. And then you ask, do you want to report it? Formal chains? No. And they can end. Just like that. It could just end. Uh, there was no duty necessarily to report. Um, you know, this is in the mid-aughts for me. There is no duty to report necessarily. And even when there was a duty to report, then it might go the level higher. Let's say it goes above the company commander to the battalion commander. A battalion commander says, oh, 
yeah, but Sarn so-and-so's career, that's who she's accusing? Uh, yeah, we, we can't think about that. Sarn so-and-so, come on over here. All right, you're going to go over to this unit. She's going to be in this building, and that's subtle. And they settle it even through non-judicial non punishment. Because <laughs> like, you're already dealing with non-judicial punishment under the Uniform Code of Military Justice anyway. Like, let's understand and be clear about that. I mean, now I was moved. we completely taken justice yeah. out of it when, when yeah. you talk about it. But it I mean, and that's, and that's even from a, what do you call it, benign neglect? That, that's from, you know, a malevolent standpoint of where you're like, uh, I really don't want to, you know, hurt this, hurt this other person. And you're not really thinking of hurting the survivor at that point, but that's the bias that creeps in. That's that implicit bias that creeps in, especially the one where you don't believe survivors. And so this is why it's so important to take all of this out of the chain of command. Um, objective third parties who are trained to listen to survivors are critical in these situations. Yeah. For me, it was one of the, you know, for, again, I was moved to a whole different continent. <laughs> That's basically what they did to me. They're like, oh, rehabilitative well, transfer. Yeah. yeah. Let's just That's what we call send, it. We call it rehabilitative yeah, let's, transfer. Let's send you back to the United States. Why don't we? And, and you'll do much better in the United States. But um, one of the things I think we, when we went into action, the grassroots, we, I mean, I'm one of those, I never go into anything with any type of expectation whatsoever, but I didn't expect it to take this momentum. It's like, it was like, you know, the small little snowball that goes into the monumental big, uh, you know, big snowball because it just kept on going and, and just like traction, like, hey, we're going to have to we're doing the petition. Hey, we're going to, uh, and, you know, submit the petition. Hey, they asked you to testify and oh my God, they're introducing the bill. And mm -hmm. that was so like, like what just happened type of moment. Like it just, it was very monumentous, but, but learning about so many different women that are out there that have been fighting this fight for such a long time and, and talking to them and hearing their stories and sharing their components of this fight. Because again, you know, there's, a, you know, there's a lot of people out there that says, well, I did this. And, you know, again, I know what I did. I, I, I know what I've contributed to this and to this fight, what Melissa did, what our, our grassroots is, you know, NVA and, you know, not our, you know, minority vets, not our Marine Corps, Pink Berets, you know, the list goes on and on. There's a multitude of us that are working, really driving this and, and forceful. And some people that have be, been behind the scenes because, you know, they're, the way their jobs are, they're not allowed to give you know, their names out, but it, it's been this cohesion of very powerful, and, and this is what I'm going to say, very powerful women, um, very powerful men, because I, I can't tell you how many men um, have reached out to me and said, hey, Lucy, thank you, and, and, and giving us a voice, and the Latino community, the black and brown community, because again, it's not just, it's not one specific, it's very intersectional the way this fight has taken because again, it affects every single one of us. We're, whether you wanna look at, uh, people wanna look at it or, or that, it's just gonna change structurally the culture of the military. And that's something that that toxic culture just has to leave the door. It's like, well, I'm tired of it already. And it's 2020, it's been, uh, I mean, I'm waiting for, you know, Tippi Hendren to show up on my, uh, my front porch with the birds, you know what I mean? That's what <laughs> I'm waiting for, but, but again, I never expected this to take place and then for it to move the way it did. And I'm, I, again, I'm super proud of all the work that all of us have done, the three of us in here, because we've had some very interesting conversations. We've had, a, you know, we, are, we agree to disagree, but we disagree to agree to a certain level when it comes to this type of work. And uh, again, the cohesion that I've experienced is nothing like it. And again, I, I hope, I, I really pray that we hear the three of us and everybody that's been around us working aggressively with us is going to, we're going to say that we are the ones that made this change. Because again, there's a multitude of women who have been working tirelessly. And in order for us to get this going, we have to always continue to work together so and there's our time <laughs> yeah i was gonna say that, that, that that's a perfect note that i know we need to wrap this up and and I, it, this is our time and, and that's exactly where i was going to say this is our time 
This is our time for military. This is our time for civilians. This is a time for allies. Um, it's, it's all in, all hands. Um, you know, it's not lost on anyone that we have a challenging year. We're, we're you know, heading into the election under um, auspicious circumstances. <laughs> Let's look at that way as I talk through my teeth like this. And so, um, you know, uh, what I tell everyone is strap in because we have a lot of fights ahead of us, but this is a fight we're going to win. We are going to end MST. It's starting, it, it started decades ago, but it's culminating with this movement. And my parting words to this audience, you know, tuning in is I hope that if you're a civilian, you understand a little bit more about what's happening in the military and you're there to support because we need it. We need for you to contact your members of Congress, to contact, uh, you know, the members in the, in the House and in the Senate. Uh, once the Senate bill is introduced, the I am Vanessa Guillen bill, it will go a long way for building our next future leaders because this is a national security crisis. Military sexual trauma is a national security crisis. We don't have enough women in the ranks because we don't have enough brass. And we don't have enough brass because we're discouraged from leaving the pipeline too soon. And whether that's civilian or military, if you want to see change, you want to see a woman as Secretary of Defense at some point, then we need to, we, we need your help too. And so that's why I'm eternally grateful to you, Adelaide. Uh, and to protect our defenders and, and to all the groups that have been continuing to buoy this, um, this issue this summer with all the things happening in our country right now. Um, this is one thing we can all roll up our sleeves and do something about. Yeah, and I know we, we're, we're out of time, but I'll just say I um, thank you, everyone, um, for tuning in, and I hope this has been um, an, an enlightening conversation. It certainly has been for the three of us. Um, and I will say just my last words are, you know, we, we've had tail hook, we've had, you know, we've had kind of moments where, where you'd think reform would come and then there, I'm not saying there ha there's been reforms made, but I, I really hope that this is the last time we're talking about this in this way and that going forward with this momentum and we could use all the help we can get as Melissa so eloquently put it. And, and Lucy, um, you know, we need we need this to continue so that we're not having this conversation again in 10 years. So mm. with that, um, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. I am Vyansa Guillen, Bill. Contact your members of Congress. Yes. <laughs>